Welcome to Magnolia United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Brad Chamberlain, and this is our service for October 10th, 2021. For the past few weeks, we've been focusing on female characters within the Old Testament at the time of Judges. We've seen that as sin increases, as people fall further from God's will, there's a parallel increasing in objectification and marginalization and abuse. Women in these stories, due to the patriarchal nature of Hebrew society, are increasingly abused and dehumanized in parallel with society's descent into moral decay. This is in direct opposition to God's will. Then last week, we looked at the story of Ruth, which also takes place during the time of the Judges. In this story, we see people who had been pushed to the margins, childless widows, beggars, foreigners, gradually being brought into the fold of society's care through individuals recognizing their humanity, recognizing the image of God in them, learning their stories, and learning their names. This week, we'll be looking at the story from John 4 of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. In it, Jesus models living in God's kingdom rather than being bound by the rules of our own corrupt, petty social systems. The story is similar to the story of Ruth hundreds of years earlier, in that acts of recognition, of care, of inclusion, of those who are other, are in fact exactly our Creator's will for us. They are the holiest form of worship we can participate in. It is the heart of God for us to participate in the humanizing of those who society seeks to diminish. Let's read our responsive call to worship. We come for God gathers us here with that community called faith, where the hungry are served first, where the thirsty drink life's water. We come for God welcomes us here into that home called grace, where the naked are clothed in robes of hope, where the stranger is embraced as the long lost prodigal. We come for God reunites us here, sisters and brothers in that family called love, where the imprisoned model justice, where the sick are cradled in God's peace. Amen. Today's gospel reading is from John chapter four, verses 3 to 30. So Jesus left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you, and who you were speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But sir... You don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling stream, spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and tell your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, 
while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped. And Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while the Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, What do you want with her? Or why are you talking with her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came, came streaming from the village to see him. Out of the depths we cry to God, in our suffering and in our pain. And it is in our confession where we realize our desire for God and our true hope for God's mercy. It is in admitting the truth of our lives that we take the first step towards wholeness and healing. Let's pray together. Holy God, hear our prayer for the mending of our hearts, torn apart by our unkindness, for the healing of our souls, wasting away from the despair around us, for the forgiveness we seek for the sin we have allowed to persist for the reconciliation of the world whose division condemns us. We pray for the courage to admit our fault, the strength to amend our actions, and the reassurance that your grace awaits us. And now we each silently confess our sins. Now please receive the assurance of pardon. God is slow to anger and full of compassion. He forgives all who humbly repent and trust in his Son as Savior and Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Offerings may be given by check to the address shown or online at our website, umcmagnolia.com. Let's pray for this week's offering. God, our provider, in Christ, you give us a spring of pure water that overflows to eternal life. Your love and hope fill our hearts. So we want to worship you in spirit and truth. Our Open our eyes to see the places in this neighborhood where our church may best care for others. Direct our gifts and offerings for your purposes. We ask this through Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Now let's pray together our Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when praying to say, Mother, Father God in heaven, your name is holy. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our offenses, as we forgive those who offend us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today is a responsive reading from Micah 6. 6 through 8. With what shall we come before the Lord? What shall we bring into the presence of our God as an expression of our worship and praise? Should we bring him burnt offerings? Should we bow before God Most High with offerings of yearling calves? 
Should we offer him thousands of rams and ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? No, O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This week we are looking at the story from John 4 of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. In it, Jesus models living in God's kingdom rather than being bound by our own corrupt, petty social system. This work of seeing the humanity and God's image in each person, dismantling the walls which divide us and the walls in our own hearts which keep us from truly caring for others, this is exactly what God asks for us. This is not just busy work or some kind of self-righteous, goody-two-shoes endeavor. It is the very heart of the worship God asks from us. Again and again through the Old Testament and through Jesus' teachings, there are admonitions against us being involved in acts of worship which only build ourselves up. Acts of performative piety are shown over and over to be among the greatest abominations to God. Micah 6, 6 through 8 addresses this. The author asks what kind of performative worship he can do to please God. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil, Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And the response is, none of that. God has told you, O mortal, what is good. God just requires this, that you do justice, that you love kindness, and that you humbly walk with your God. Jesus demonstrates this same principle throughout his life and ministry. In Matthew 25, 35 to 40, we read, quote, For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And then the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my sisters and brothers, you were doing it to me. When you did it to one of the least of these, you were doing it to me. And when Jesus enters Jerusalem on Holy Week and heads into the temple and flips over the money changer tables and those selling doves for sacrifice, well, Jesus says in Matthew 21, 13, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. His action and anger, the thieves in question, it's not the money changers and the dove vendors. His anger is towards those who are using the temple for self-righteous, self-serving purposes, and were no longer caring for those who were oppressed and hurting, no longer caring for the widows and orphans and foreigners. And so he flips the tables, shutting down the ability for the religious and social elite to try to assuage their guilt and build their reputation through performative worship. Because what God wants from us is sacrificial worship, of caring for others. In James 127, we read the same admonition again. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. And let's just make a note on this verse. Refusing to let the world corrupt you is not a statement meaning that we need to be pure and set apart from the world. It means that the systems of the world teach us to objectify others. The systems of the world, our economic pursuits, our power pursuits, our security pursuits, 
These are the very systems which keep us from caring for orphans and widows and focusing just on ourselves. So we are not, we are to not be corrupted by these systems. And instead, regardless of what the culture around us expects of us, we are to care for those in the margins. God wants shalom, wholeness for all people. And he has called us not to be some kind of elite, set apart people who keep ourselves safe and protected, but to sacrificially care for others, to be his hands and feet and mouth, carrying comfort, love, humanization, community, inclusion to those who the world would ignore and abuse. Today we're looking specifically at the story of the Samaritan woman at the well told in John 4, 3 to 30. This story again is about a woman at the margins of society and we see how Jesus interacts with her. He does not in any way objectify her, but treats her as fully human and fully important to him. He shows us that these human divisions and walls based on nationality, on gender, on religion, on reputation, these are not part of God's will at all. They are the signs of human sin and social brokenness. But faced with these circumstances, Jesus cuts right through them and brings us straight back to God's will of reconciling us all with him and with each other, to the dismantling of the walls which divide us and which encourage us to treat others as lesser than ourselves. The story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman is a case study in humanization. In Jesus' time, the Samaritans lived in the land between Judea and Galilee. When Assyria captured Israel around 700 BCE, some were taken into captivity while others were left behind. Some of those left behind intermarried with the Assyrians, and they became the Samaritans. The Samaritans had their own unique version of the Torah and a unique system of worship compared to the Jews. By Jesus' time, the Jews and Samaritans did not deal with one another. Many Jewish people in Jesus' time looked down upon Samaritans because they were descendants of Jews who had married people from a different ethnic and religious background. Foreigners, religious apostates, not to be trusted. They're not like us. They are others. But Jesus does not avoid traveling through the Samaritan region on his journey between Galilee and Jerusalem. And when he sees this woman at the well, he does not avoid the well. At the well, he does not push her aside. He simply approaches her and asks for a drink. And her reaction says it all. How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? The text then gives a concise, trite statement of the issue, explaining as a side comment, Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. So she's a woman, a foreigner, a religious apostate, and Jesus knows also that this woman has not lived within the societally expected relationship boundaries. When she says, I have no husband, Jesus replies that she is right, quote, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. So again, more strikes against her. By Jewish social rules, she was subhuman. She was other. She did not belong. She was someone to be avoided and to be dismissed. But Jesus, in every way, steps outside of these social norms and expectations and lives instead by the reality of God's intended order and treats her as fully human, a full co-image of God, a beloved creation of God worthy of dignity and respect. In this single story, we see Jesus treating her as a fellow human being in the fullest sense, and we can learn some key features of how he goes about doing this. First, Jesus practices equality. Jewish people weren't supposed to have anything to do with Samaritans because they were considered ethnically unclean, being the mixed descendants of Jewish and Gentile ancestors. The fact that Jesus would even travel through the area, much less actually converse and share water with one of those locals, it's a major break with social norms and a blow to the rampant racial prejudice of the day. But he didn't stop there. 
Just as the Jews didn't converse with Samaritans, men didn't speak to women as equals, if at all. If word had gotten out that Jesus was spending time with a woman at a well, it could have been scandalous. But he did not let these imposed social prejudices get in the way of him treating her as fully human. He not only spoke to her, he spoke to her as an equal. Just by being where he was and speaking with the person he spoke to, Jesus was carrying out a revolutionary act of equality. He broke down human-made barriers that kept people excluded, devalued, and oppressed. He let the Samaritan woman and all of us know that he regarded her as a fellow human being, equal in value with any other. That is humanization. Also, Jesus made room for her agency. He treated her like a fellow subject rather than as an object. He didn't yell at her or shame her, avoid her or diminish her, but rather invited her into a conversation. He didn't silence her, but rather left room for her to speak and to express herself, including her frustrations with the ways she'd been treated. He didn't condemn her, but rather showed her compassion just as she was inviting her to come to know him for who he was. In his conversation with the Samaritan woman, Jesus recognized something that we all too often forget. She was a person created by God in his image for a purpose and with a free will. He allowed her to fully be herself, which opened up the door for her to feel fully known by him and to come to fully know him as well. Respecting her agency is a part of treating her as fully human. And this is the kind of recognition God longs for. This is pure worship. Jesus also practices affirmation towards her. Before she knew anything else, this woman knew that Jesus was on her side. He treated her with respect. He listened to her. And he expressed his desire to see the best for her come about not only by breaking down the ethnic, religious, and social barriers that held her back, but by freeing her from her own insecurities and giving her abundant, never-ending life. Jesus was on her team, and she knew it. She was valued. She was affirmed. She had agency. She was being treated as an equal. And as the story wraps up, we found out this action, this interaction it turned out pretty well for everyone involved. The woman came to know Jesus as her savior, and she even went home and told her community about him. And as a result, they came to believe in Jesus as well, bringing about the first instance of Gentiles coming to know Christ in the Gospel of John. All as a result of Jesus's humanizing conversation with this foreign woman at the well. Our calling is to be those who act towards reconciliation between people and with God. God doesn't want pious, empty worship from us. God wants us to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly. God wants us to care for orphans and widows in their distress. God wants us to care for the least of these, because truly I tell you, he said, just as you did it for one of the least of these, you did it to me. Jesus is modeling precisely what God has been seeking from us since the beginning. He knew how to make every person he came into contact with feel recognized, heard, and known. And he did so by treating each and every person as fully human. And you and I are called to the same. This is the most sacred and God-pleasing act in which we can be involved. Let's pray together. Lord of living water, pour your mercy on us. Wash us clean and make us true disciples. Help us move from the paths of selfishness and stubbornness to the channels of hope and peace. Enable us to place our whole trust in your love. Strengthen us, provide for us, 
that we may see and respond to your image in everyone we meet, that we may be vessels of your love and mercy, and that we may extend your grace to all. Amen. Receive today's benediction. Go now from this service of worship to the service of God's people near and far, refreshed by the living water that Jesus offers you. Listen for the parched voices of the least of these. Search out the dry places and the arid souls and become for them a spring of living water. And as you go, may the blessings of the God of life, the Christ of love, and the spirit of grace be upon you this day and forevermore. Amen. All right. See you next week, friends. Bye.